Today we will be speaking, today we will be speaking of a giant, uh, a giant in every way. I mean, physically, he was over six feet tall. He weighed more than 300 pounds. But more importantly, he was a giant in the colossal dimension of his work. It is incredible that he, a single man could produce what Diego did. Uh, if we were to place all of his murals and his paintings and his drawings in a single surface, they would occupy a surface about, of a, about a square mile of art, more than any other artist since Michelangelo. And not only is the quantity of this work, but also the importance. Diego Rivera, and we see him here painted by his friend, uh, Amadeo Modigliani, the great Jewish Italian artist. Diego Rivera <clears throat> embodies political art. He is uh, a, a, an artist that expresses an opinion and a commitment, who has a definite view of history and is not shy in communicating this view and this emotion. Diego Rivera also changes the direction of art in the world. Before Diego Rivera and the muralists, the artists of this continent, the American artists, and by American, I don't mean only the US, the whole continent, was always following the lead of the Europeans. It was always the Europeans that were at the avant-garde, the ones that set the tone, that uh, led the way. And in this continent, we followed with more or lesser success what the Europeans were doing. But with the muralist revolution in Mexico, the artistic initiative of the world is seized by America and it would never change because right after the muralists, in many ways, very intimately linked with them, you have the American abstract expressionists. Is that a little interference then? Yeah, I, I took care of it. And, and then you have pop art and we have, so, so the, from followers, the artists in this hemisphere become leaders. And it is Diego Rivera and his vision of reviving the great murals of the Renaissance, a type of art that had not been used in this way in 400 years. And with this technique, informed by modern art. Diego Rivera creates murals that are so powerful that they change the way that Mexico saw itself and the way that Mexico is seen in the world. And today we will speak of this uh, great artist, of this great revolutionary of this uh, uh, figure that has become emblematic with Mexican art and whose vision, whose vision changed the direction of art in the world. 
He was born in uh, Guanajuato. Guanajuato is a, a beautiful colonial town in the central Mexican uh, Cordilleras. It is a, a city that is surrounded by silver mines. And it has all these mountains and the houses are built in this way. So it's interesting how sometimes instead of going up, the houses go down. And some of the streets are so narrow, it's so beautiful. There is even an alley that is so narrow that they called it El Callejón del Beso, the alley of the kiss, because somebody can kiss another from different windows of the same street. That is how narrow it is. Some think of Guanajuato as one of the most romantic places on earth, a really beautiful place. And Diego Rivera was, uh, was born the 8th of December of 1886. And he is a twin. This is something that hasn't been sufficiently studied because his, his, uh, his twin, Carlos, dies before he's a year old. And it has been said that there's nothing more traumatic for a twin than to lose his brother or sister. That it introduces a, an element of emotional disassociation. And seen under this light, I guess that some, some aspects of Diego Rivera can be understood in, in this way. You know, he, he was a man that had uh, this enormous capacity of work and, and so on, but, but there was always a certain emotional unavailability in him, some certain distance. I mean, uh, an anecdote that for me paints him very well, it happens when he is in a cafe in Mexico and they kill a person right in front of him. And, and Diego Rivera pulls out his notebook and starts immediately to draw the scene. Perfect. I mean, it's a little hard to understand, but that is how Diego Rivera was. The, the same is true about the, the kind of distance that he had with his women, you know, that this uh, relationship that was, that was always a part of him that was kind of untouchable. And in his case, uh, the situation is very dramatic because after the death of the twin, the mother becomes so distraught that he is sent to be raised by an Indian lady. And of course, he would never reconnect with the mother. He would always look at, at the mother with anger all of his life. Now, Diego Rivera created his first scandal when he was about four or five years old. And there's a lot of mythology in Diego, but this, this we know is true because it was related by the aunt who took him to mass. And when they saw the, the image of the Virgin, the aunt says, Dieguito, why don't you kneel and pray to the good virgin and ask her for your mommy and your daddy and so on. And Diego says, no, I'm not going to do that. Why? Because she cannot hear me. What do you mean she cannot hear you? I've been looking at her. She's got no holes in the ears. I mean, 
Yeah, it says, well, this is the image of the virgin high above. So anything that you ask the image, the good virgin will give you. And he says, but that is like if I asked the photograph of my father for my allowance. And then when he sees the priest asking money, he says, it's a lie. All that this is a lie, they're robbing. They have to take him out of the church. And since then, you know, they referred to him as the young atheist. But what impresses me is a couple of things. First, the capacity for observation. I mean, how many of you have noticed that those figures of virgins and saints in the churches do not have holes in the ears? And then it is also the capacity of thinking logically from a very young age. He begins to draw almost immediately. So much so that they have to cover the, the house and the furniture with paper. And yet he refuses to draw anything that he doesn't understand. He doesn't draw the mountains, for example, until his father takes him inside of a mountain and he sees a mine from within. And he's fascinated by, by toy trains. He would do this drawing of his mother when he was 10 years old and before he received any form of training. And by 12, he is admitted into the prestigious school of San Carlos. San Carlos uh, is Mexico's most prestigious art school. Here, he would have several, several important teachers. Uh, one would be Santiago Rebull. And Santiago Rebull would tell him, you know, these things we call paintings are attempts to capture on a flat surface the essential movement of life. The picture, if it's any good, should contain the possibility of perpetual motion. The second one, Jose Maria Velasco, teaches him to paint the landscape. And the third, uh, Felix Parra, teaches uh, the young Diego Rivera to love pre-Hispanic art. He uh, is, is hard at work in San Carlos and uh, at one point, he uh, rebels and is expelled from San Carlos because he expresses his opinions against the established teachers. And so for the next few years, he would walk around Mexico in a way similar to Jose Maria Velasco painting the landscape. And the father wanting to give him something to do to focus his talent. See, he could sense that he had a lot of talent, but sometimes talent is not enough. You have to figure out as a, as a, as a parent, how can you focus the energy of your kid? How can you make him concentrate? And so his father speaks with the governor of Veracruz, Teodoro de Esa, who offers Diego Rivera a scholarship. But the condition is that he has to buy his own uh, boat ticket with an exhibition. And so suddenly this forces Diego to concentrate, to paint, to develop. And with the help of Gerardo Murillo, Dr. Adel, one of the great pioneers of 
Mexican modern art. He organizes this exhibit, buys the boat ticket, and is ready to leave to Spain on 1904. And uh, in Spain, he would work uh, in the workshop of Eduardo Chicharro. It was interesting, you know, one of the last lectures I did uh, before the pandemic, I was in Spain and I went to talk about Diego Rivera and I went to this auditorium and it was the auditorium named after Eduardo Chicharro, Diego's teacher. So he would arrive at this workshop and he would continue to work in a similar way that he had in Mexico, only that in Spain, there is something new and different from Mexico, which is the existence of great museums. Diego Rivera goes to El Prado and looks at the works of Velázquez and Goya and Rembrandt and Rubens. And he tries to recreate what he's seeing, not only around him, but also in those paintings. And how can he get to the, the color? And how can he paint the world vividly? And as you can see in, in these series of works, he becomes a, a master of conventional painting. He does these uh, water scenes that become the mirrors of the buildings and the boats around and on them. This splendid way of uh, doing a composition with water and the reflection of the water and the echo of the real image and the reflected image. His work acquires solidity and perfection. His works like this one, uh, the Picador, considered a, a great example of his Spanish period. But Diego Rivera is always, uh, always anxious. He returns briefly to Mexico in 1910, and he exhibits the works that he had done his work is very well received, but it is exactly this year when the Mexican Revolution breaks out and Diego Rivera would return to Europe. He would meet uh, a Russian artist called Angelina Velov. And with Angelina, he would uh, travel to the rest of Europe. He would spend some time in Belgium and here you would see these uh, paintings that he does of Angelina, uh, clearly influenced in classic uh, portraiture. But if you compare, you know, the real Angelina that we see on the photograph, and then the one he paints, you can see how much he adds to that image. The same is true about places like the house on the bridge, now, finally, they, they, they go to England and then they establish themselves in Paris. And Paris was the place where modern art lived. Here's where the Impressionists had worked, where uh, Picasso was innovating. And in France, he adopts all these different types of techniques. Every time that a, a young person tells me they want to be an artist, I say, do what Diego Rivera did, master it all. So he does uh, paintings like this, that could be like Segura or Signa, or this one clearly 
influenced by Monet or by the Dutch masters. He does it all, paints as the futurists, uh, looks at space from every perspective. Diolimera has an interesting idea. He says, whenever you feel that you're being influenced by something, embrace it. Because only when you have tried in your own expression, the expression of somebody else, can you separate your voice from theirs? If you don't do it, that spirit will possess you. And I find it's true in any discipline. You know, if you feel you're being influenced by a way of writing or by a way of painting or by, embrace it, experiment with it, make love to that influence. And in these years, we see Diego's experimentation with many styles. It is isn't an exuberance of creativity, of experimentation, of learning. And sometimes you see uh, several influences coming together. In this case, you have the obvious connection with El Greco, but also you begin to see the emerging cubism in this works. So you see the elongated figures, but you also see the geometric fragmentation of, of the background. This work uh, that Octavio Paz considers his first masterpiece is another example of, of, of a work that is almost cubist. And notice the interesting combination of colors that are supposed to not combine well, like blue and red. And yet he experiments and creates a new synthesis. So in Montparnasse, Diego Rivera would become a, a close friend of Pablo Picasso. And he joins the Cubist movement which takes uh, this exploration of reality to an even more radical way. So Cubist style allows him to look at something from many perspectives. For example, this is a bull ring. If you were painting this in a conventional manner, you would recreate exactly what you're looking at. But look what the cubist painting does. It looks at that same scene. Let me look, see it again. And then from below, from above, close up, distance, from many perspectives. In other words, the cubist presupposes uh, an observer that is in motion, that can fly over things, a modern vi vision of things. Uh, cubism also allows him to look for the essential traits of, a, of, a, of, a, of, a, of objects and of people, to find like the basic characteristics of a face. And then also uh, to paint some, somebody, Picasso does this a lot from the front, and from profile, sometimes from several perspectives. And then not only have to paint the person, but also what that person is thinking. In this case, it is an author, uh, Ramon Gomez de la Serna, that is thinking of all these violent thoughts. And so you see a decapitated head in the background and you see the, 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 the figure of the author like this kind of demon and, and you see everything that he is thinking and, and what he's looking and what his vision is. Diego Rivera also uh, joins this kind of very active social life that is full of parties and debates and discussions. And even within the Cubists, he becomes a, an innovator. He discovers what he calls the neutral spaces. For example, if you look at this work, 
that is uh, Zapatista landscape. It's done on wood. And he intentionally leaves some of the wood without paint. And then he finds all these symbols about Mexico. It is said that uh, uh, Picasso was this kind of omnivorous artist and that some of the artists were afraid to invite him to the studio because everything you did, he saw, and then he recreated and did it better than you did. And apparently this happened with Diego because uh, then Diego saw what he was, he had worked on in Picasso's work. And Picasso says, oh yes, I did that a month ago. And then Diego touched the painting and it was still fresh. So that kind of introduced a certain distance of him. Also, he starts to have problems with uh, the critics that, you know, consider him like, uh, like a savage, you know, from the tropics, right? And start making all these uh, cartoons of him. He has a specially contentious relationship with Pierre de Reverdy. So he starts separating himself from many of his colleagues. And then Angelina becomes pregnant. And he does these fabulous cubist portraits of her that I love to share. Here you see Angelina before she's pregnant. And here you see her pregnant. And notice how everything converges in her center, her belly. And then this is the childbirth. And notice the relationship of the mother and the child, the connection between the two. Unfortunately, after World War I, there is a, a pandemic like the one we've been living in, a flu. Uh, and then there is also massive economic crisis. Diego Rivera has lost his scholarship from Mexico. His work is not selling in Paris. And the couple is so poor that sometimes they cannot afford to heat their apartment. So unfortunately their, their son that he had called Michelangelo and gives you an idea of the hopes that he had for his kid, uh, dies and he's a year and a half old. And so Diego Rivera enters into this uh, uh, profound uh, depression, not only because of the loss of his son, but also because he feels that his career is, is going nowhere. You know, he, he is not satisfied with what he's doing, but he doesn't know how to change it. He doesn't see uh, a pathway within the, uh, the Cubist movement. He doesn't see a pathway in Mexico. And it is in this moment when one day he's in this gallery and he sees a fruit vendor pass by and he realizes that the fruits that that man was selling were much more beautiful than any of the paintings that existed in the gallery. And that, that same night he begins slowly to go back to a more natural representation of reality. He also discovers Cezanne. It is said that one day he's in this gallery that has some Cezannes in the window pane. And he's very poor, he cannot go in the gallery or much less buy anything, but he stays outside watching the, the Cezanne. And about an hour later, the owner of the gallery, you know, puts another Cezanne for him. And he stays there 
and then it begins to rain and he's still there until the gallery owner tells him, I have no more Cezans. And Rivera would say that then he would come back to his little home and he would get fever and in his delirium, he would imagine the most exquisite Cezans that Cezanne had never, had never painted. So he is in, in this rethinking of himself, trying to find a new synthesis of what he had done, when he meets a man that would change his life. This guy is a, a, a doctor. And this is a, this doctor, Elie Fauré, had been in the trenches of World War I. He had seen the suffering of these soldiers uh, in these trenches infested with rats, suffering from wounds of chemical weapons and mustard gas. And so he has a completely different vision from the critics in, in Paris. And he tells them that, he says, you must be able to feel the pain of others. In your blood, the blood of others should circulate. And he tells him that art is the only way in which people can define themselves and, and leave a permanent mark of our spirit in matter. He tells him, do not be afraid of your intellect. That which kills is not learning, it is the failure to feel what one learns. And he tells them, you must paint for the people. And the Oliveira says, but, but how do I do that? That is what I've been wanting to do. And he says, go to Italy. Look at the murals of the Renaissance. So for the next year, Diego Rivera travels all through Italy. He completes thousands of drawings. He looks at the frescoes of Mantegna, of Giotto, of Michelangelo, of Da Vinci. He learns the fresco technique. And with that knowledge, he feels he is ready to go back home. Diego's uh, return to Mexico is one of the most moving re-encounters with your homeland. He would say, my homecoming produced an aesthetic acceleration impossible to describe. It was as if I were born anew, born into a new world. Gone was the doubt and the inner conflict that had tormented me in Europe. I painted as naturally as I breathed, spoke, or perspired. My style was born in a moment, <clears throat> except that this birth had come after a tortuous pregnancy of 35 years. And so he looks at the, at the colors of Mexico, at the people. And, and, and everything I saw, a potential masterpiece, the crowds, the markets, the festivals, the marching battalions, the workingmen in the shops and in the fields. In every glowing face, in every luminous child, all was revealed to me. And I had the conviction that if I lived a hundred years, 
I could not exhaust even a fraction of this buoyant beauty. So <clears throat> Theo comes to a Mexico that had changed dramatically. There was a revolution that had completely changed the <clears throat> institutions. And there was a new uh, secretary of education that wanted to use murals as a way to bring <clears throat> to the public life the illiterate workers and peasants in Mexico. And so it's almost like <clears throat> everything comes together. There is talent, opportunity, and destiny. Because Diego Rivera had, had prepared himself to do murals, had studied the murals of the past. Murals were not fashionable before. And so Diego Rivera was ready for this opportunity. This is the first mural he does. Uh, in the high school where Frida Kahlo studied. And he puts all the emanations of the female spirit and of the masculine. And then he would meet another woman, uh, Lupe Marin. This woman uh, had these beautiful green eyes and uh, a certain ferocity about her. She was coming from this region in Mexico called Jalisco, where mariachis and tequila come from. And people have the reputation of the women are very, very beautiful, but also uh, very temperamental. And so Lupe almost immediately uh, seduces him. It's almost like a, like a, like a vision. And he would have two children with Lupe Marin. And Lupe would inspire his Chapingo Chapel. Something I recommend you to visit when possible. It is uh, for many Diego's masterpiece. And at the sides of the chapel, it has the cultivations of the earth and right in front, it has the liberation of those who work the earth. So you see, for example, the, the leader that is spreading the seeds of rebellion. And right in front, you see germination, the process of these figures that are about to be born. Then you have the death of the leader and his burial as floration. And then you have the victory of the revolution and you have fructification. But it is a mural so perfect that when you look at the ceilings they appear to be sculptures, like the third dimension. Or these images that seem to be floating. Truly, 
truly beautiful. And then in, in the each extreme of the chapel, you have on one side, the virginal earth, and this was posed by Tina Madotti. Remember that lecture I gave you some weeks ago? And right in front, Lupe Marin as the pregnant earth. Then uh, Diego Rivera would, would paint in the Ministry of Education for the next four years. These are two huge patios. And in one patio, he would put all of Mexico's uh, feasts and in another, all of Mexico's working processes. It's truly remarkable. There are lengthy books about this. You see the everything. It's almost like a history class, a production class. You see the uh, weavers, the miners, the people doing flower arrangements, the in, in the, uh, the fiestas part, you see the, the corridos, the people singing. The, at first, the idea or the commission had been to paint people of all the different regions of Mexico in their traditional dress. But Diego soon found himself not only painting that, but also the ideas, the struggles the coming together, for example, of the workers and the peasants. He does uh, parts of, of life, like the, uh, the burial of these workers. And you can see how he has processed all the many influences that he had learned in Europe. A work like this, for example, you can clearly see the influence of, of Giotto. but brought to a contemporary world. And while he was doing this uh, very ambitious mural in education, in the Ministry of Education, one day uh, a young girl, he had divorced Lupe. And so he saw this young girl that he was in one of the higher levels and this young girl that asked him to come down and it was Frida. Frida had suffered an accident and she had done some paintings while recovering and she uh, she said she was very expressive and she had these uh, very thick eyebrows and when she spoke they appeared to be the wings of a blackbird he would say. So he starts visiting Frida and uh, he falls in, in love with her and uh, they would marry uh, the 21st of August of 1929. He was 43, she was 22. And Frida's mother was very disappointed. She said that this was like the wedding between an elephant and a dove. And this uh, cartoon of El Chango Carvajal would seem to side with her opinion. Almost immediately, uh, Diego begins to paint Frida in his murals. Here you see her, you know, distributing rifles among the workers in one of his murals. Then uh, he would do this mural in the Ministry of Education of Mexico. And this would be a, a mural in movement. So as you walk down the stairs, you are surrounded by the entire history of Mexico. So you see, for instance, the, the ancient Mexico with the Aztecs and Quetzalcoatl. And then you see the conquest, the struggle against the, the French invaders in Cinco de Mayo and the revolution. And in the final panel, you see uh, uh, 
a, a, a mural called Mexico of Today and Tomorrow. So all of this you see as you walk through the stairs. It's really remarkable. With uh, Frida, uh, Diego travels to Cuernavaca where the US ambassador would, would commission a mural in Morelos. He would paint this wonderful image of Zapata with his white horse. And sometimes Diego Rivera painted himself in the murals. Here, for example, you see him in, as one of the characters, or here you see him as one of the workers, or in an offering, or here, he is like an architect. With Frida, they would go to San Francisco. And in San Francisco, Diego Rivera would do several murals, one in the Stock Exchange, but in the Art Institute, he would do this mural where you see him painting a worker, but then you also see the building, the workers building the building. So it's almost like a, a a, a, a cycle of activity. And all the, the artists are facing the wall. So they're giving you their back. And yet people, some critics were very offended because they said that what Diego Rivera was really trying to do was to give his big behind to the American public, imagine. Then Diego goes to Detroit. And for the next three months, he walks all over the industry, takes thousands of sketches. And in the two, in the, the large patio, he would do this wonderful series of, of murals. These murals are perhaps the greatest artistic depiction of technology painted anywhere. You can see like all the industrial process from the extraction of the materials to the assembly lines, all the process of work. When you're here in the morning that the sunlight hits the part where you have the, the furnace. And then you have th these machines that somehow echo a new type of goddess. Even the, the machine has a little bit the form of the Guatlique, the Aztec goddess. But Diego Rivera would say that the greatest uh, compliment that he would get in his career was when all the engineers and the workers came and saw this mural and did not find a single mistake. And if you look at the, at the mural, you see it right in the back, you see a tiny little car, which is exactly the opposite of what we see in advertisement that shows us the car, but not, none of the workers that did that car. So Diego Rivera puts in the front the human element of production. Frida would be pregnant, but because of her accident, she loses the child, which would inspire this dramatic work. And Diego Rivera would, would paint in one of the panels uh, the, the fetus, the baby that they could never have. But notice the, the perfection of the baby. Then Diego would travel to New York. And in New York, he would get the, the commission by the Rockefeller family to do a mural in the new RCA building. At the time, one of the most important buildings in the world. And so Diego Rivera 
uh, does this mural. The theme is man at the crossroads looking towards a better future. And so he would paint in the, in the center a, a worker, but to the side, he would include the image of Russian revolutionary Lenin. So Rockefeller demanded that he take the image of Lenin down, that he replace it with another figure. Diego Rivera refused. And a scandal, one of the greatest scandals in art during the 20th century erupted. Eventually, the mural was uh, destroyed by hammering on its surface. But it was recreated in Mexico. And so this is the way the mural uh, would have looked. Uh, as you see, there is these two, the worker in the middle, and then you have these two ellipses here to, on the top is everything that you can see through the microscope. And then the other ellipse is everything you can see through the, the telescope. And I wanna share with you uh, a recreation of the destruction of this mural from the movie Cradle Will Rock. And you can see how you know the mural was destroyed. Leo Rivera would say, you know, if they destroy my mural tomorrow, I will begin again. Because for me, painting is not just an intellectual effort, it's also and mainly an organic function. And like a tree, I will bloom and give flowers again tomorrow. He would spend all the money that Rockefeller had paid him doing uh, a series of movable murals. Sadly, most of those murals were burned. We have very few left. In Mexico, Diego Rivera intervenes with the Mexican president to give asylum to Trotsky, uh, the Russian revolutionary that had been exiled by Stalin. And eventually Trotsky is, uh, is murdered by Stalin's agents. And Diego and, and Frida, uh, fearing for their own life, come back to the US and do his last mural in the US. It's in, in San Francisco. And it is a, a mural about Pan-American unity in, he, in which he would try to, to combine the best of the North and the South. So he would represent the, the Bay Area in San Francisco uh, the industrial and the artistic workers, 
the indigenous from North America and South America. And then he would put the heroes of South America, like Bolivar, of, Me of Mexico, like Hidalgo, of the US, like Washington, Jefferson, Lincoln, and John Brown. He would also uh, paint Charlie Chaplin's depiction of Hitler and the great dictator. And, uh, and this mural is still there. It's in a, in a college in, in San Francisco. Then he would come back to Mexico. And this time he would denounce corruption in Mexico. And he would do this mural in which he would present uh, the, the corrupt uh, generals, the corrupt presidents. Uh, he does this image of a, of a general like a pig that is stealing the fruit from Miss Mexico. So during the next few years, his mural commissions dry up. And so Diego puts a lot of energy into his easel works that are also masterful. I'd like to share with you some of these works. Here you see the, the portrait of Lupe Marin. Notice the beautiful way that he uses the mirrors. Or of his daughter, Ruth Rivera. And all the time, this is a portrait of a dancer, Ana Merida. You see that he can try anything. He has uh, a naturalistic, but also cubist ways of representation. He's a very good friend of Maria Felix. And he paints her, this is this dancer. And I love this work. If you know, I'm the son of a dancer and it's very rare to, to, to see an art that actually gets it, that can actually show you what movement is. And here you see Maria Felix. Or Dolores del Rio. And Rivera is also a good example of, of that idea that the role of art is not the exact reproduction of reality, but the sublimation of reality. For example, here you see this woman. To your right, you see the photograph. But then notice Diego's work. It's clearly here, her, but notice how he takes some element of her personality. He kind of reveals through the work uh, her attitude, her, her charm, her way of looking at it. It takes out everything that is unimportant and it conserves the essence of the individual. Sometimes his portraits like echo, uh, in this case, like the, the legs echo the, the lilies in the background. And his paintings of the simple people are among the most beautiful of his, of his production, both in the luminosity of the works and also in their sublime essence of what, in this case, a flower vendor is. We have other classic images, and these are huge paintings. Nobody has painted children like Diego Rivera. This is La Niña Lupita Cruz, endlessly imitated. Then Diego builds a museum, but not for his work. He builds a museum for ancient Mexican art. He 
He's the first one to do a, a pyramid in Mexico in 500 years. It's called the Anahuacali. And all the works are, are displayed in the Anahuacali in a, in a way that, that would be congruent with how we are told ancient Mexican art was displayed. He surrounds himself in the area with a, a Mexican hairless dog uh, with popular furniture, with folk art. His, his entire lifestyle is a promotion not only of himself, but of all the popular artists in Mexico. Some even accused him of buying fake uh, pre-Hispanic art. And Diego Rivas said, what do you mean fake? He says, well, it's done recently. He says, well, and so what? The same clay, the same hands, only a few years in between. And here, I guess he would signal, you know, that, that he saw the beauty of, of the work of art and not just how old it was. Because nowadays, you know, if, if something is, you know, created 500 years ago, it's worth a fortune. If it's done a month ago, it's worth nothing. And then when he returns to do murals, he would recreate all this ancient civilizations. Nobody has painted the ancient indigenous cultures of this continent like Diego Rivera. People that have been just vanquished, that have been destroyed uh, either by the violence of the conquistadores weapons or by smallpox and other viruses. It is believed that almost 90% of the entire indigenous population was eliminated as a result of the conquest. And so it is very moving to see these huge murals of Diego Rivera, thoroughly researched. Uh, Diego would also have this unlimited curiosity, not only for history, but also for science. In La Cuenca del Rio Lerma, he would try to paint all the microscopic life. And the idea was that all of these creatures would be seen through water. So he calculated the reflection. We see these microscopic organisms, the cells, in the different human groups and races. And the idea was that the water would give you a, a sense of this world. And he was envisioning one of the biggest, the most beautiful creations, but unfortunately, the, when the water came, the colors didn't resist and it took away the mural. It has been restored recently. And after this experience, Diego Rivera reinvents himself again to use mosaics so that he can paint underwater and directly facing the sunlight. And so he would do these exterior murals, like uh, the god Tlaloc that you see here, where he combines mosaic and plants, this wonderful creation, directly facing the sun. Or he would do swimming pools that are exposed permanently to sunlight and to water. He had the vision of creating a mural that would wrap around an entire stadium in the south of Mexico City. 
and he did all the drawings. But unfortunately, only the central one was created. He also tried this technique in El Teatro de los Insurgentes. And this is a fabulous mural because it brings to life the Shakespearean idea that all the world's a stage. And so he puts this central mask with these beautiful hands. And then you see the, the comedian Cantinflas in the center. You see uh, to the left and right, the singers, the dancers. But then you also see the characters in history. This is Cantinflas. Now, Frida was an endless agony in health issues. And she accompanied Diego to the end uh, when she could no longer walk. And in some of his last works, Diego would actually paint Frida in a wheelchair. Frida would die in 1954 protesting against a military coup in, in Guatemala. And Diego aged almost instantly. And a year later, he was diagnosed with cancer. Uh, in the same way uh, of, of Frida, he, he would uh, look at, at watermelons as a source of inspiration. And he would try to, to find health in the Soviet Union, but his cancer was not stopped. And in the last years of his life, his paintings and the end of his life come together. He does all these like uh, harvests. And then he does a series of sunsets. You can see all these sunsets in the beautiful museum Dolores Olmedo. Diego would die in 1957. And the last mural that I want to share with you is not the last one that he painted, but it, it is his most autobiographical. It's called Sunday Afternoon at the Alameda Park. And in this mural, he presents in the first plane, uh, the people in Mexico that are dreaming. And above them, you see what they're dreaming about. And it's all in this kind of anirical uh, image of these yellow trees, you know, like, a, like a dream. This mural was uh, very controversial because in one of its sections, one of the dreams was the dream of Juarez and uh, one of his companions in Nigromante that had the phrase, God does not exist. So for many years, the mural had to be covered until Diego agreed to remove the, the phrase. But you see, for example, the, the little pickpocket that is about to steal a handkerchief and he's dreaming on the sandwich that he will buy with that. Then you see uh, the old man dreaming of Porfirio Diaz or this other man dreaming of the first balloon trip in Mexico. Then you see this young man that has been turned away from the park and he's dreaming of revolution. Or you see uh, uh, 
a man dreaming of Madero. And at the center, you see Diego Rivera as a boy wearing the same clothes that he had used when he had entered art school. And he's holding hands with death in the form of La Catrina and Frida Kahlo that has uh, the symbol of the yin and the yang. So it is almost like if everything came together, the reality and the dreams, the present and the past. It is also as if there were no boundaries between what we dream and what we live and between the life of an individual and the life of his country. And when looking at a mural like this, the poet Carlos Pellicer once said that when, when humanity painted on walls thousands of years old, like in Bonampak, or when they painted, they presented themselves tempestuously in the skies of the earth, like in the murals of Jose Clemente Orozco, or when they could tell history as a genius like Diego Rivera, a volcanic faith in the human spirit shakes history. Thank you very much. <laughs>